Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tuesday Talk. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you for joining us live. And for those of you that are here uh, watching the replay, welcome, welcome, welcome. And those that are on podcast, I'm so glad that you're able to be here. I have a special guest tonight. I'm really blessed um, to have uh, Dr. Alwine, Dr. Halisa Alwine with me tonight. We're going to just be talking about a few different topics. Very excited, um, really want to get into what it means to create holy spaces, and then also just talk about some things that are on Dr. Halisa's heart um, this week. But before we do that, I'd like to um, just have Dr. Halisa pray for us. We are really wanting to create a time uh, right now where the Holy One will speak to every person that is supposed to be spoken to, and I just I feel it in stirring in my spirit right now that there are some things that need to be said and some things that need, people need to hear. And um, this is the time, Halisa. This is the time that we get to do that. What a privilege, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we get to open the space for that to happen. <laughs> Let me put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Make some space. Make some room. Let's, let's make some space. What do you say? Okay. Thanks very much. Go ahead. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together uh, to create a women's minion, Father, that, that hopefully we can stand between judgment uh, and, and those who still need time to repent. Father, evoke in us a, a sense of the power that is in prayer and the holy spaces that we can create with prayer that the, the Father has given us that ability to make prayers where there were none, to make obedience to your commandment where there was none before. We thank you for such a privilege to be able to do those things. And so, Father, tonight, wherever those holy spaces need to be opened up and enlarged, we pray that that would happen. We pray that your spirit would move through us, move through the words, move in our hearts, do the, the tenderizing that needs to be done, that you would drive away the distractions of the world and truly just open up this space here uh, with this fellowship of believers, because each of us is here for a particular reason. There is no, no random drop in here. Instead, we have assembled together to do this evening what can only be done by this group alone. Yes. We have assembled here because what we are about to do must be done together. And so whatever that something is, whatever each lady needs, to be accomplished in her life or what she needs to realize she needs to help accomplish in someone else's life. Father, open our minds and our hearts to the suggestion of your word. Do whatever needs to be done with your spirit. And Father, I pray that anybody who leaves this particular Zoom room would leave here empowered, would leave here comforted, and would leave here prepared to, to open up even, even more holy spaces in her life. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Yes. Amen. Oh, that's perfect. That is perfect. Thank you. So, Halisa, you were saying that holy spaces are created. Like, first of all, let's talk about what is a holy space and, and how is it created? You said obedience creates a holy space. And we know that beautiful word, Shema, that word where we're listening and not just listening and not just obeying, you know, like a, a rote routine, but actually obeying because something inside of us is being touched and changed and year and begins yearning to accomplish whatever it is that he's asking us to do. That's really what we want to be doing. And, and so what is a holy space and how do we go about doing it? Let's talk about that. I think a holy space is something that occurs when we separate it from something else. That's half the equation. I know people tend to think of holiness as being set apart. Mm -hmm. but if you think about it, the quality of just being set apart is to be dead. Mm. If my spirit is set apart from my body, we call that being dead. Oh. If, <laughs> if my soul is set apart from my body, <laughs> we call that being dead. Yeah. Your, if your body's separated from from the your breath and your life, then you're dead. <laughs> right. 
but apart like the from second that. day of creation, it's characterized by separation of the waters from the waters. Right. But until it's gathered on the third day, it's not called good. So I always try to teach that that added component that completes the element of holiness. Yes, you were to be set apart and separated from certain things right. in order to be gathered right. to like kind and like mind. Yeah. Um, that that completes the process that we would call sanctification. Mm -hmm. Just like, let's say, a cup of wine on Friday night or a cup of grape juice. Well, you're separating that particular cup of grape juice from every other cup of grape juice in the world, yeah. but you're not done just by pouring the cup. And so when you complete that process by saying the blessings over the cup, by sharing the cup with the other people at the table, uh, by sharing the songs of Shabbat and the meal of Shabbat with the people at the table, then I think you kind of get the idea of what Kiddush or sanctification means we yeah. also are being taken out of this part of the world but then gathered into like-minded people in our living rooms or around our dining tables or and so forth on the shabbat or at the feast mm -hmm. that completes the process mm -hmm. and i love that because you say we're being gathered with people that are like-minded maybe around our our dining room tables and yet we delight in inviting people who may not yet be like-minded, but they're being gathered. They're being drawn in. We have to look at it from a different perspective. Uh, you know, that's operating in hope. That's, <laughs> that's really um, not judging with our eyes, but saying, well, thank you, Father, that this is the person that I get to invite and they accepted. So they're coming in. So this is the space for them. Right. Because holiness, if, if we read the scriptures, we don't even have to read that closely. We can just read casually, which I don't recommend, but just a casual reading of scripture will tell you that sanctification or holiness, it's a process. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's accomplished in a moment. Right. Um, look at how many of the, the laws people like to skip over and read over, but there's so much to be learned about the mm -hmm. laws of purification because it says, okay, first you do this, then you do this, then mm -hmm. you um, then you do that, then you mm -hmm. do that, then you do mm -hmm. that. And it, it's showing you that it's not just like that. Right. It takes time to go through the process and to think through those things that do create the holy spaces. And just the obedience to the process is opening up holy spaces. And that process too, because like you were saying, it's, it's not that you are just holy, that you're just set apart. It's that you are in the process of moving forward. I love that Hebrew is action driven. It's all about movement and flow. I mean, it's lyrical, it's musical, it's, it's movement on every level. And so I love that how you said that. It's like separating is not just for in and of itself, just like with creation. It was separated in order to gather for life. Everything is about separation in order to gather together for life just like the purification if somebody is set, set outside the camp we read in the scriptures they're set outside the camp that's not the end of life they're set outside the camp so that they go through the process what for so they can be gathered back so they can be brought back in right even the process of death have you considered that right it, interesting it was he was gathered to his people yeah. Maybe he's separated from these people in death, but he is gathered back to his people. He's gathered back into Abraham's bosom. And so he's he's clicked back in uh, just because we can't see the, the righteous dead person doesn't mean that they aren't still gathered and in a state, yes. uh, you know, of a kind of a holiness as that soul ad adheres to others of like kind and like mind under the altar. Uh, in the heavenlies mm -hmm. so that that process if if you think about all the the purification laws the goal of it at the end is to bring you back in and reinstate you or to bring you into an even holier space oh, yeah. than mm -hmm. you started 
So mm -hmm. it's all about restoration and advancement in mm -hmm. terms of getting closer and closer and closer to the presence of Adonai. Hallelujah. That, that, that will melt away anyone who's saying, I'm not worthy or I'm not, I'm not good enough or I haven't arrived yet or I'm so far behind. That just kind of takes it all away because it really is a process. So if you're in the process, you're good. <laughs> right. In that process, that's where you need to be. And he'll he'll take care of the in, you know the he'll take care of the rest of the journey. But right. being in the process, um, that holiness is a function. And I think somebody said over here in the chat that uh, Dr. Dina Dyer was saying holiness is a function. It's very much about um, action. Yes, exactly. It, it really, it really is. It's very different than what we've been taught. A lot of us are unlearning a lot of things, and so um, I appreciate you kind of breaking it down for us, and you know, having it in um, manageable pieces. Because I, I talk with women during the week that are a lot of them are feeling that just the standard life that they're leading doesn't feel holy to them. Um, and really, uh, that's a misconception because, well, number one, if you're raising children, that is a holy space. Raising yeah. children. <laughs> that is if you think about it, the, the, the heart of the Torah is found in the book of Leviticus. Yes. And uh, Leviticus in Hebrew is vayikra mm -hmm. and called. Well, you know, mm -hmm. when Israel calls to the Holy One, he answers. He's waiting for you to call to him, to cry out to him. And so in holiness, the, the heart of holiness is a cry to the Holy One to reconnect with mm -hmm. him. And it might seem like we do mundane things that don't matter. But if he puts in things like for us ladies, like mm -hmm. having your period, something okay. as mundane, and here it comes again this month, yeah. you know, well, who thought that should make it into the Bible? If we think of holiness, we want to think of these pristine, sparkling things. But if you're going to have babies, yeah. if you're going to have your monthly period, mm -hmm. if you're going to maybe come into contact with dead bugs, in your, your dishes or your bowls. There's all sorts of things in there that were like, ew, gross. But he's saying, no, if you will manage it, according to these instructions, what seems gross to you is mm -hmm. actually transforming into a very holy thing. And so there, there is no unimportant, if, if it's like we were saying, as we were chatting before we started that, you know, in Hebrew, we make prayers. Yes, I love that. That prayer didn't exist before you made it. And that's mm. not mundane, even if it's just a short blessing, like, Father, thank you that the sun came up this morning. I'm really craving vitamin D today. Well, that those words, that space of time mm -hmm. that you set aside for him to give thanks to him, taking a moment before you started your day, if you say the, the short sentence blessings throughout the day, if you have a daily prayer life, you were making things that didn't exist before you made them. You were being like him and then dedicating that creative quality to make a prayer or to, to make an act of obedience mm -hmm. in his honor. And that is creating a holy space. If you consciously look at a food product and say, no, I can't buy that for my kids, that might not seem like anything big to you, but you just made a holy decision not to put something unclean in that child's mouth. Oh, that's so good. Yes. You just created this yes. space in the grocery store that wasn't there before you arrived. That's right. And so, you know, the you resisted an urge. Maybe if somebody had some road rage and, and used bad finger or whatever. <laughs> and you turned to the kids and said, you know what? We all get frustrated and angry. And then you turn it into a lesson about you know, going to the Father in prayer when we're angry, um, self-control, these sorts of things that the word teaches, you've taken what looked like a very dirty situation and you have turned it into an act of holiness. You have done the Shema. You have taught this to your children. Mm -hmm. 
So there's, there's nothing mundane about a mundane day at all. A mundane day is filled with holiness. Yeah, it really is. Every one of us. And one of the things that for me in my life, what I feel like has been really, um, I was going to say beaten into me. <laughs> yeah, it kind of feels that way. Is that, um, that this is my life right now. I'm not waiting for my life to happen. I'm not waiting for something to be completed or healed or fixed or finished or this right now is my life. When I was driving here tonight, uh, we were driving through traffic. My husband and I are, uh, we're at a hotel right next to the hospital and he has, a, he has um, an infusion tomorrow. So we're, we're here traveling and all of these things were happening. And I kept thinking in my mind, even as I was on the freeway, Father, you've ordained this. Here we are. We, we hadn't planned on this two days ago. Now, all of a sudden, this is where we are. But this is my life. And so you've ordained this. You are leading and directing and guiding my steps and my husband's steps. And he already knew the people that we were going to be meeting uh, when we got here to the hotel in the lobby. I mean, he already knew all of that. Everything that we do, we can say it's not valuable. That's, that's really, we need to check our hearts if we think that anything that we're doing in our life is not valuable. If it's not valuable, the only reason it's not valuable is because we're not engaging with the spirit of Elohim. That's the only reason why it wouldn't be valuable, right? right? So every space that we go to. I mean, that's why we're told we're the light of the world. How are we the light of the world, Elisa? You know, how are we the light of the world if we feel, if we're living in a, a state of feeling like we're unimportant and nothing that we do is valuable and, you know, well, we're not a big teacher and we're not this and we're not that. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So you're, you're sweeping the floors, sweep those floors, pray those prayers. You've got 45 minutes of sweeping floors. You, that is a lot of time to be engaging in a space. Right. And if, if it's you not have valueless. an attitude of gratefulness, yeah. sweeping the floor as you're sweeping the floor, yeah. it won't be so mundane because you'll say, you know what? There are so many people out there who don't yeah. have the floor to sweep. Exactly. Maybe their homes were swept away in a yeah. tornado. Maybe they were right. swept away in a flood. Maybe they've never slept on anything but a dirt floor. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're sleeping on an iron bunk bed somewhere with yeah. a concrete floor. Oh, thank you, Father, that I have yes. a luminous floor to sweep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> thank yeah. you that my thank you that all of these people are in my house making all this noise. Thank you, thank you, because there are a lot of lonely people that don't have anyone making noise. Right, because you can take that, that. Little moment, I wish I didn't mm -hmm. have to sweep the floor, <laughs> and all of a sudden, with an attitude yeah. of gratefulness, yeah. you turn yeah. that into a holy space of gratefulness right. that there is a floor to sweep. Absolutely. So Absolutely. It's, it's a challenge to, to see how many times in a day you're actually able to do that. Challenge it. Let's challenge ourselves. Right. Challenge ourselves to, to see how, how often. I have... Um, a very good friend, uh, Linda Millett, and she and I are, we started reading this book a few years ago, um, and it's called The Garden of Gratitude, and we started reading that book, and it, it pretty much just beat us both up horribly. I mean, that book hit my wall so many times. I was so like, I'm done with this. This is ridiculous. This isn't, <laughs> it was crazy. I was very resistant to being grateful because I thought that I was grateful, and then as I was learning really and truly about gratitude, I realized, oh, gee whiz, I really am not very grateful. Um, and so now I'm much, much more mindful of being grateful. And it has seriously changed my life. Yeah, I remember a poem I read in high school. I, I think it was by Nikki Giovanni. I could be get, getting that wrong. But in one of the poems, she talked about you know, how we long for things that we don't have. Um, but then she says, but we can be grateful that there is still something left to want. Oh, wow. 
You know, because if you've ever done that, if you've ever fought and fought and fought to achieve something you thought would just be the ultimate, you would be somebody or, or whatever, and then you achieve that thing and then you found out that didn't bring me happiness. And now I've got to look around and find something else to want because it just wasn't what I thought it would be. All these Hollywood stars, I mean, they, they kill themselves, they get hooked on drugs, they they get involved in this, this yeah. crazy immorality, mm -hmm. they're dysfunctional, they don't know the truth from a lie, they do dumb stuff. And the longer they're a star, the worse they get because they yeah. realize what they thought they always wanted and would be the sure sign of success once they achieved it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't what they thought it was. Mm -hmm. And so even the fact that maybe we don't have the perfect furniture, maybe we don't have enough right. bedrooms in our house, maybe our car right. didn't start some days. Mm -hmm. If we had all those things, they still wouldn't make us happy. Right. They might make us more comfortable, but they yeah. won't make us more happy. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's easier to open up those holy spaces when we can find joy, even if there's something left to want. Right. That's right. And even the hopefulness, just having hopefulness and anticipating, not anticipating getting everything that you want, obviously. And as you just said, get everything you want. All of a sudden, all of that is meaningless. It's like, well, now what? But finding joy uh, in, in everything and being grateful in everything changes the way that you see your circumstances. And I know that personally, um, being grateful has definitely changed my life completely. And my husband's too. Uh, he is very, very grateful. Right. And then it's just, we it changes. Question last night after yeah. class, after our zoom class uh -huh. and, you know, somebody, is invariably going to ask the question, where do I learn Hebrew? Right. Uh, and I can give you all sorts of resources, but the, at the bottom of every page is going to be, if you don't treat it like a college class and set aside the time and the money for it, you probably won't progress. Mm -hmm. And so they were saying, well, we just think in the, in the millennium, we will just all of a sudden there's, we're going to yeah. have this free download and we'll instantly know Hebrew and it, it won't uh -huh. be so hard. And I tried to convince them, I don't think I sold them, but I tried to convince them that there is a joy in learning Hebrew. Yes, I was to say that, yeah. Day by day, you'll make yeah. connections that you never made before. And it's like, you have this treasure box on your desk and you know, if you just sit down there and you open that treasure box, if, if you hang in there with Hebrew, yeah. You're going to open your Bible that day and find a treasure that you had never seen before. Yes. And if you get an instant download, then mm -hmm. you won't have the joy of those, those little discoveries that, that the joy, I think, is part of holiness, too. Uh, it's creating, carving out those spaces of time, like it, it doesn't feel very holy to learn Hebrew. But it is a holy language and it will help you understand the holy word. And so you're still carving out holy spaces in that day. If you take Absolutely. your 10, 30 hour a day, it depends on where you are. If you're trying to learn or just maintain, yeah. but if you will dedicate those times and set them aside, the rewards you get back will be so much more then the, I call it the grunt time where you're just acquiring yeah. the grammar and the, you know, all yeah. that. <laughs> Unfortunately, you don't have to learn capital letters in Hebrew. So. Yes, that's one thing you don't have to learn. <laughs> you might have to learn a few ending letters. But, <laughs> uh, so I don't know, maybe it's an instant download or he might ask us, he's like, do you want the treasure every day or do you just oh. want the treasure at one time? Yeah, no, it's the journey. It's yeah. Of it. And, and, uh, I know for me, Hebrews ch changes, it changes my life every day. And, and I'm, I'm dealing more just with letters more than anything else, not in conversational Hebrew, but, um, but just dealing with the letters alone, just the letters alone will just change your life and seeing, um, the course that I have, it talks, we have three sections. And one of the sections is where's Yeshua in this letter? And 
recognizing how he walks things out, how he models every single thing, not just not just the word of it, but the action of it, every single letter he walks out. It's so beautiful. It really is. And, you know, the letters are holy, holy. They, they open up holy spaces all the time. So when, you know, when we study the letters, when we study the words, when we learn how to begin reading, even if it's just, you know, baby words, even if it's kindergarten words, but learning how to read those words, memorizing those words, memorizing the letters. Oh my gosh, it opens up doors that into realms you would never know if you don't do it. It's so worth it. And I know that's really? my little bandwagon, but truly it's not just me. So yeah, I think that learning the Aleph bait, mm -hmm. it improves your memory. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're living in a generation where we're so flooded with chemicals Mm -hmm. to, to interfere with the way that our brains function and all these elect this electronic noise and this challenge mm -hmm. of having to learn some sort of technological thing every day and if we learn it today they'll change it and update it tomorrow so our brains are overloaded but to me the learning the hebrew aleph bit has helped mm -hmm. me to retain scripture that maybe otherwise the noise of the world would have crowded out or put it in this dark, dusty file that would have made it very difficult to find again. I always think there's this little guy up in my brain sitting at the filing <laughs> cabinet who just does this all the time. And as time goes on, you know, he misfiles more and more things. And that way I can blame it on him. Oh, <laughs> I like that. I think that he works for me too. <laughs> yeah. But, it, you know, holiness in scripture, the, the pattern we have, especially in Leviticus, is that holiness is something you manage among other people. We get fixated on the people that get put outside of the camp, but those are for only certain cases. It's, it's going to describe, you know, a, a small minority of people that would ever be cut off from the camp. Oh, yes. It would ever be permanently out of the camp. Yes. Most of the management of uncleanness goes on in some level of camp um, or where you live in your home, in your city or whatever. Most of it's going to be managed right there among your family, your friends, your co-workers, the priests. It's it's part of your Relational. life. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that just shows you if we want to grow in holiness with the father, he's saying, mm -hmm. okay, I want you to do that too. So the way you're going to learn how to do that is you're going to manage your holy spaces with people. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> That's not real popular. <laughs> not real popular, but look at the opportunity. Yeah. Right? Like for something as mundane as say having a period, you say, oh, sure. Period. But in a home, mom mm -hmm. is for a certain number of years you, you might have little girls later but for a certain number of years mom is going to be the only person in that household who can make that commandment obedience on behalf of the family mm -hmm. and so there's going to be certain things the husband can only do to create holy spaces in the home so she puts the things that she can manage she brings those to the home he brings the things that maybe only a man can manage. He brings those into the home. And then you have children and there's commandments that are relative to children, like obey yes. your parents. Yes. Obedience yeah. opens up holy yeah. spaces. And so as a family, what we thought, you know, if a child is taking out the trash just to be obedient, well, that child has just opened up a holy space. Holy space. Like parents. Yeah. You put all that together and there is no average day. There's there's no average day. Just degrees of holiness in the day, depending on how many fights we have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really true. I had a, a wonderful opportunity this past week to spend some time. Uh, our oldest son came and, and spent some time in our home. And, uh, you know, Halisa, you had... Uh, just you were talking about this in one of your classes and you were talking about having the mezuzah on the doorpost of the home. And, um, and so the, 
my husband and I were, were thinking of this mm. while we were preparing for our son to come. And so when he arrived, we had already, our intention was, Father, allow this to be a space where you, his ears will be opened, his eyes will see, where, uh, where we will speak in such a way that we'll be bringing glory to you while he's here. And uh, I just, I can't even tell you, it was the most amazing thing. And when, when my son left, I felt what happened uh, for me. It, this is how it felt for me. It felt that it was like that whole Judah experience where Judah approaches Joseph and talks to Joseph. And then when Joseph reveals who he truly is, Judah had done that. He had approached his brother and he had, he had done that very thing and pretty much reclaimed his honor by doing that. He was no longer the one who was, you know, willing to kill off his brother. He was willing to give his life for us. I mean, there was so, it was so beautiful. And my son, what it felt like to me when my son was leaving was that he had reclaimed his, like his leadership role. That's how it felt to me. He honored my husband and I in, in ways that he had never done in his lifetime before. And um, there were just things that occurred in our, in our time together. It was really beautiful. And that's what it felt like to me. If I really felt that restoration beginning and him being put into a place where now that mantle, now he's going to see that, you know, to me, it was like he got taller and his shoulders got broader and, <laughs> you know, it felt like he was truly being able to step into what it is that the Holy One has for him. And um, even without knowing it, you know, and so that was the other thing I wanted to say is that, um, Halisa, what you're talking about is it doesn't, it, the Holy space is our obedience to him in walking out, whatever it is that's in front of us in the moment. And that may seem very unholy in the sense of, you know, periods don't seem holy, do they? <laughs> and the feelings, the, the cramping and the bloating and, and those things that go along with it sometimes, that doesn't feel very holy either. But when, if we do it, as you're saying, if we will just even use those things and be obedient and open up that space, like this is the, this space is happening because I am, having my period, which means that I am preparing for life. It might not be now, but I'm in the preparation and that's the holy place. Right. And it, it makes us conscious of what I call encroachment. You know, in football, they have a, a violation called encroachment because that means you got in somebody else's space and you weren't supposed to be there. Uh -huh. And so often if we are trying to manage these holy spaces, um, maybe we do fall into the rut of thinking it's just another day. You know, you know same old song, second verse, um, <laughs> which some of us would love that, but <laughs> <laughs> some of us are sick of the drama, right? right. Um, but you, you can get any, even in a rut of the drama, like, you know, same old day, same old drama. It just depends right. on what your life experience is. And it might feel as though you're losing your identity somehow in this repetition of days that the same events are happening over and over. And you either think they're not meaningful or somehow you think they are adverse. And I think this encroachment, this is what is taught to us by the degrees of holiness in scripture there's they're seen as 10 degrees of holiness if we look and just look at israel and the world as a whole um, you know you've got the land outside of israel you've got the land of israel itself and there's certain commandments that only apply to the land i know that that comes up every time we talk about shemitah or a jubilee and somebody somewhere else is trying to keep the Shemitah. Well, you're never going to be able to do that exactly because that's a commandment unique to the land. There are certain mm -hmm. commandments unique to the land. You can mm -hmm. practice a principle and a pattern 
in order mm -hmm. to learn, to remember, to prepare, to rehearse, but you can never do it just like it's done there. Right. So it's a, it's a holier space. And then you might have a holy space within Israel and, and there's principles there of a walled city. There's certain laws that apply when you live in a walled mm -hmm. city. Mm -hmm. And then there's the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, you have to eat the sacrifices and the second tithe within the walls of Jerusalem specifically. You can't eat them in just any walled city. Um, and then within the walls of Jerusalem, you have the Temple Mount. And then you have, you know, if you've ever seen diagrams of the temple, there's several different, um, as you get closer and closer, several different areas. You've got the rampart. Um, and so this is going to be a place uh, where only certain people can come in. Then you can come on in. There's the court of the women. Um, and at each section here, it's kind of dropping off the number of people that can get in closer and closer. Finally, you get up to the court of Israel and the altar. Again, you're dropping people off as you get closer to that location. Finally, the holy place and the holy of holies. And there's very few people that are ever privileged to go into the holy place and the holy of holies or even to the altar. And so there's no reason to feel like, well, you know, if I'm not getting to the holy of holies, then somehow I'm defective. You're not. Um, you know, even the most righteous among the prophets, if they were not Kohanim, they could not go into the Holy of Holies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he creates these holy spaces for a particular reason. And we tend to think it reflects on us. We're, yeah. we're a little narcissistic that way. Yeah, we, do. we truly are. <laughs> I'm yeah, to hands. <laughs> right. But he's saying, no. There's places for you to manage your faith walk and to understand that there's a boundary at each place. And what he's saying, I want you to respect the boundaries that are here. If you want to move from here to here and you have the ability to do that, then here's what you need to do. Some boundaries right. you will never cross. Um, some boundaries you might cross, but maybe in a different way. Like there's a, a Levitical priesthood, but there's also a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, it may be that that priesthood is the boundary that he wants you to operate in, wow. not this one. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you're defective. It means no. it's your area. And when, mm -hmm. when we work in our assigned area, mm -hmm. and we manage our conditions, <laughs> we'll call them yes. our challenges yeah. Yeah. <laughs> within those assigned areas. Yeah then we are creating those, those holy circles that just go out mm -hmm. from the throne, that go out mm -hmm. from the holy of holies. But the challenge for us today, and I think this is where we can get into that rut of thinking just another day, we don't realize it's happening sometimes. We're not managing our boundaries. Mm -hmm. And this was the job of the Levites. They were put around the perimeter of the tabernacle to make sure you were in the right condition before you came this far or this far. And sometimes we let people get in our holy spaces who have no business being in that place. Mm -hmm. We all have our own spheres mm -hmm. of holiness. There's the people in your most intimate space, maybe your spouse, mom and dad, your children, mm -hmm. maybe the, the closest family friend, those are in your most intimate spaces and they'll know everything about you. In fact, they'll probably know more about you than you do. You can always ask them. <laughs> yeah. And then you move out a little bit and you have your close friends. Mm -hmm. And then you move out a little bit and you have your friends. And then you move out a little bit and you have acquaintances. You know, you might run into them once a year, once every five years. And then you move out a little bit and it might be people you would only see at high school reunion. Never been to one. But as you... As you keep moving out, they're moving out into these other realms because they're really not prepared and neither are you for them to function inside that holy space. It'll create chaos if you allow them to penetrate into that space. And in the same way, even a king couldn't offer the, the incense. And, and if he tried to, what was gonna happen? 
uh, the one king I think that tried it, he broke out with leprosy. And this is what happens when you violate a holy space. Sometimes inexplicable things happen. Um, leprosy was not considered a natural disease. No, it was supernatural. Supernaturally imposed in mm -hmm. order to straighten you up, to bring you to <laughs> repentance. Yeah. And so a lot of times we're, we're like, why is this happening? Or why is that right. happening to them? Right. So the first thing a priest would probably help you do is examine your boundaries. Have you violated wow. a boundary, a spiritual boundary? Or has somebody, have you allowed somebody to come in and violate yours? Ooh, and we, we have to police them. You know, if, if we're a nation of priests, we're going to have to make sure that we're not letting people encroach upon us in a way that ultimately, yes, it will harm us, but it's going to harm them too. We're not doing either one of us any good if we allow that to carry on. And as women, sometimes culturally, we've been brought up to be submissive and quiet and compliant, and we're less aggressive sometimes about guarding those holy spaces. Mm -hmm. Now, a mama bear and her cub, yeah, um, that gives you a great example of how to guard a holy space. Uh, right. But sometimes, you know, it, it seems in this generation, so many boundaries have fallen that moms that should be mama bears are not right. protecting their cubs. Right. They're allowing things in their homes that should never be in their homes. They're putting devices in children's hands that should never be in their hands at that age because they can't manage their holy spaces yet. You have right. to help them. Mm -hmm. And so as you look around and, and you start really start taking account of the things you let in your house, it might be through music, it might be through television or movies or friends or devices. The technology age has given just so many, it's opened doors that we didn't mm -hmm. tend to open. We think we've got a front door and a back door and maybe it's right. a garage and the adversary is saying, oh no, baby, you've got way more doors <laughs> and windows than you know. <laughs> you've got, yeah. well, we won't get into it, but yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of them. Right. Neat. And so Very as true. Parents, you want to police, and it's not a bad word. No. We want to police the boundaries of our family. Had Eve policed the boundaries she was given, then neither she or Adam right. would have eaten the fruit. She didn't police her boundaries. Mm. Um, and so if look at the opportunities that Jacob missed with his son. Yeah, to police their boundaries with one another and, you know, to, to teach that modeling, you know, about envy and, and being one as a family and not making little factions within the family and so forth. Um, and so that tells you if Jacob could make mistakes, we can too. Yeah. You know, we're not better than Jacob. Uh, <laughs> we, want to be. we want to be better than David, but yeah. the, the truth is David sometimes wasn't a great dad. Right. We all have those areas where we let, I mean, imagine in hindsight, what he thought about himself. I sent my daughter into a rapist. How can I live with myself? Right. Did I not see right. that one coming? Right. I mean, man, did I not see right. that one coming? Did Why didn't I see that coming? <laughs> to me? Yeah. And as parents, there's going to be things your kids get into. And you're, in hindsight, you're going to say, did that not smell fishy to me? Yeah. At the time? Right. So just don't ever take any day as a mundane day. You've got to put on your badge every morning when you get up. Yeah. And police the boundaries of your home to make sure that you're maintaining holy spaces. Um, teaching them respect. Again, it's, that's a holy boundary. And I, I always tell people, you, you know, when you get down south, because the kids don't ever call an adult by their first name, unless it's preceded by Mr. or Miss. Uh, even somebody we were talking to today down in Loosedale, they're about the same age we are, but still call him Mr. Arnold, <laughs> because he is still a little older than me. Um, mm -hmm. 
you, that's something in the South I love because I, I know when we lived in Louisiana, people would call my mom, Miss Bobby. Mm -hmm. And it took a while to get used to that. Uh, but I liked it after a while because there was an element of respect that said they are the adults. And no matter how crazy they're acting today, <laughs> they're still the grownups. And we're losing that because commercials are pushing into our children the idea that grownups are inept, they're dim, they're dim wits, they're, they're immoral, they just aren't turned on to the new morality and so forth. The adults are always being portrayed now as the income poops. Right. I'm not saying we haven't had a generation of income poops who have allowed the family to fall apart, who have just had, you know, they're, they're not really having families, they're having children with this person and that person and that person. The father can repair all that, but you have to be willing to put those boundaries back in place. And then, yes. then that's when you move forward. And that's when you understand the value of that system. Uh, but there's just so many opportunities now with the internet. Yeah, I, we talked about this in class, I think last week. How, and I'm kind of probably not the average, but you all get emails. And if you have a job, you might get a bunch of emails. And maybe you know the people those emails come from. Or maybe you monitor Facebook messages for your company. Well, you may not know those people when they message you. You may not know those people when they email you, but with technology, they can just take their phone, dash off their way better. The, the, the two thumb people I really admire, um, they can send you a message, hit send and put the phone down and they don't have a second thought about what just went out. Right. So when you receive the message, then you feel obligated to act upon it because now those words just came in my house. Now those words are in the door. I let them in because this was a door. Mm -hmm. This was a boundary. And I can set up some boundaries on here, but I can't stop everything. I found that out. Um, so you even have to monitor technologically, again, what kind of content, but we can't forget like that Mr. Arnold, Miss Bobby, right. we address people in a message, an electronic message, it never hurts if the person doesn't know you and you're not good friends. If you're not in one of those inner circles, mm -hmm. it never hurts to say, hello, my name is. Right. <laughs> exactly. Introduce yourself. Right. Instead of this is what I want, or this is what yeah. I want you to do, or where can I find this? Basically mm -hmm. asking people to be concierge service for you. And they never signed up for that job and they're not going to get a paycheck unless you're mm -hmm. at work working for a company and they're paying you to be mm -hmm. concierge service. Mm -hmm. But we've started to treat our family and friends and acquaintances and even people we don't even know as concierge service. Right. And when you look at the holies of Leviticus, theft is a biggie. It's a huge thing. You, you not only... If you repent, see, if you don't repent, you don't even get the opportunity to bring a guilt offering. I don't know if you ever picked up on that. Exactly. Like, forget it. Just restore. Yeah. Add the fifth, but you can't even bring a guilt offering because you had to be forced mm -hmm. to admit you did it. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you realize you've stolen something, you restore the item if you can. The original item, if it's possible, if it hasn't been altered, you restore the item itself. If it's got a monetary value, you add a fifth. And then on top of that, you take the Asham offering, which is not cheap. Right. Um, because you acknowledge your guilt in the situation. And these are tangibles. But again, the internet age has created intangibles. So I can steal your time and you don't even know you've been robbed. Right. <laughs> and I don't even know I've robbed you. You know, I thought you wanted to go do that for me. You know, I thought you didn't mind uh, looking that up for me. I thought you didn't mind this or that. But the truth is we had not really attained that level 
of holiness with one another. We mm -hmm. had achieved that bond where I welcomed you in this place. And it's like, you know, oh, Queen Esther, what would you like up to half the kingdom? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're not in that level, then, then don't ask for half the kingdom. <laughs> because he wants us to build that through relationship with one another. And less and less, we have the opportunity to do that with our face to face. But that's how ideally holiness would be built. But that's something we can we can practice if we know we've got to use the internet a lot and send messages a lot. What if we took that one thing, courtesy, respecting somebody's boundaries. And when we sent a message, we thought about how it would land. Very good. We thought about the person before we prioritized what we needed from the person. Uh, that's loving your neighbor as yourself, and that creates a holy space. And so with the internet, doesn't mean we have to lose our manners. True. You know, it can start with, you know, hey, girlfriend, how was your day? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, or hey, sweetheart, how was your day? Instead of, hey, I need you to take the trash out. Mm -hmm. And we forget that. I do. You know, yes. I, I think about, I need to check this off my list and get it done. Right. Right. And then I forget about the relationship. Yeah. I'm speaking from experience there. Mm -hmm. the, the more we will kind of think about those boundaries, then I think the less we'll feel like it's just another day because we won't have really the time. Yes. We'll be thinking about how to create these holy opportunities, you know, just, um, Sometimes in this electronic age, if you're just respectful to someone that you've never met before and do say, hey, I know you must be incredibly busy. Do you have time to, you know, on the job, that can make a huge difference in how you get along with a coworker or a boss. It works on the internet too. Right. You know, and we're all busy. I don't know of anybody. Right not they might think right. what they're doing isn't that fun but they're busy you know and we can show that respect and somebody who is having an otherwise frustrating day or maybe a mundane day all of a sudden you've made them feel like they're worth something there's somebody in the kingdom somebody called me sir somebody called me ma'am uh, or somebody called me miss bobby or you know mr arnold or somebody wanted to know how I was before they told me what they wanted. It's fine if you're sitting there drinking coffee, but you, you, do, you truly have to discern what are the shoes they're standing in today because I can't see them. They're not sitting across the table from me drinking coffee. They right. could have had Alexander's sorry, horrible, no good, very bad day today. And uh, I think that makes a huge difference, you know, in a mundane day mm -hmm. and a day where we can go to bed feeling comforted, like we're not going to lie awake at night and just feel like producers for the world. And, and I think women are prone to that. We just mm -hmm. feel like there to produce for people. Right. You know, right. it's all live. about productivity every day. <laughs> yeah. Right. Wow. Wow. So there's something as, as small as this mm -hmm. could transform somebody's day if we do it a little bit differently. If we do a few extra little thumb thingies, hello, my nigga, yeah. mm -hmm. how was your day? Mm -hmm. You know, when can we get together? Is mm -hmm. there anything I can do for you? Um, th that's what I loved about Charlie Brown. Mm -hmm. The first time I met her in person, mm -hmm. uh, we were sitting, I think, eating a, at a restaurant, and she just turned to me and said, how can I serve you today? Mm -hmm. I thought, nobody ever asked me that. Yeah. It's usually the other way around. And right. Like, you know what? I don't know really much about her, who she is, where she comes from, any of that, but I like her already, you know? Yes, yes, exactly. 
that exactly. made that's beautiful place in my day where I went to bed feeling a little better that night about mm. humankind and yeah. Hebrew roots kind and messianic kind and and people on this walk we don't have to be rude uh, we should be known for our kindness is what Yeshua said and our love yes yes Not for our rightness right exactly because <laughs> everybody's exactly. right everybody's That's right <laughs> but a kind person will stand out exactly that's very true yeah and you know it's 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 beautiful right now that kindness is something that you're we're not getting a lot of in um in our social media in our um our social media i'm very not social media person but i'm trying to be better about certain things but um uh, just in the everyday, you know, when you walk into a store, it's it's really interesting to walk into a store. And if you stop and give kindness to someone, it it kind of, it, it upsets their apple cart. I mean, it really, it takes them back. It's like they stop because they're so used to just rushing and having everybody griping at them or, you know, demanding of them. I'm thinking, mostly I'm thinking about the grocery store because that's about the only place I've been going lately is to occasionally go to the grocery store. And um, just talking with with the workers there and, you know, just asking them a question, but just engaging them, it takes them back. They're not used to people actually engaging them as a as a human being. Right. They've lost their identity because all they are is workers that are there for our pleasure to hurry up and get done what we need done. Get that stuff stocked and make sure that you get us through the line quick, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it's really, uh, that's another challenge that we can have, ladies, is 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 um, the next time that we go go someplace, how about if we make a make a, an effort on our part to just notice somebody, ask them the name, you know, it seems like everyone jokes about that, like my, our kids, our, my husband and I, our children always joke, like, they don't need to know your name, they don't care what your name is, you know what? they do care when you say what's your name and then you call them by name everybody loves to have their name said everybody they do and it's yes. uh, mary catherine wrote something in the chat she said a bunch of robots mm -hmm. and we get so busy in the day all of a sudden we're turning people into clickable icons mm -hmm. let me just click on this icon and i can mute this person on zoom and that yeah. kind of carries over into the world. Like, yeah. okay, I need this. Why won't she just answer the phone already? Take me off hold and yeah. give me what I want. Right. I am not a patient elevator music listener. <laughs> I'm like, look, my time is worth something. I mean, it does have a dollar value. Yeah. You're not paying me to sit here and listen to music while you talk yeah. to somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't help if you tell me what number in line I am. <laughs> You're not helping me. <laughs> the robot's telling you that and they don't care. <laughs> and they're right. making it anyway. <laughs> right. But then I have a lot of compassion when the person yeah. finally comes on the line. Sometimes yeah. that anger that starts to build up, you can hear mm -hmm. in their voice, they're trying so hard to be nice, but they probably just yeah. had a hold of three boogers in a row. Right. Exactly. Somebody tearing them apart for something that they have no control over. Yes. Yeah. And, and I wouldn't be so rude as to say, how's your day going? Cause I kind of know. Oh, gee, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably not a good question. <laughs> yeah. But just being pleasant and letting yeah. them kind of hear in your voice, I'm not here to destroy you yeah. and make the next 10 minutes miserable for you just because your company is comprised of deadbeats at the top doesn't mean I'm going to take it out on the person that answers the phone. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. We're, we, that's really reflecting Yeshua because um, what was one of the qualities, one of his qualities that he was known for it, as far as I'm concerned, for more than any other quality that he was known for, was Racham. He was he was he was compassionate, merciful, loving, caring, you know, embracing. He was that's who he was, and we are supposed to be reflecting him. 
If that's not something that's in our life every day, we really need to take courageous moral inventory <laughs> and see where we need to make some corrections and walk in obedience because obedience is that we are, when it says that we're to love our neighbors, it's more than just um, not running them over. <laughs> it's, mo it's more than just not moving your boundary line. It's, it's really kindness because kindness Kindness will break down walls that knowledge and wisdom and rightness and none of those things will move somebody like kindness will. True. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's easy because I'm no. saying I'm the worst offender at wanting to get things checked off my list. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can misjudge. We can think somebody is farther in our, in our holy space than they think yeah. they are. Yeah. And, you know, with the, it seems like the closer in people are, the less you, you really bother about the niceties mm -hmm. and True. it's just, you're part of me. And so yeah. I'm not going to do hello. My name is, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, are you busy today? How was your day? You know, um, you kind of dispense with that right. because they are in so close and right. you can just judge that. Mm -hmm. And you think you're being palsy wowsy with somebody and they think you're being discourteous. Mm. And so you, you constantly have to, to walk those borders and kind of know where people are. And, and if you've offended them, uh, say, oh, okay. You know, I thought we were pals. Don't say that. That'll just make yeah. it. But <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You're right. I forgot, you know, um, how was your day today? You know, right. that was, that was selfish of me not to, to ask, because obviously there's something on your mind and I didn't read it. And just mm -hmm. if we're quick to apologize. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it, it does take down that defensiveness, but it will tell us, you know what, you weren't really aware of where that boundary was. You misjudged right. it. Right. And you need to, you need to push that out a little farther in your mind and where it was set. Don't be offended. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you didn't think that's where you were with that person. Mm -hmm. Just reset the fence. Mm -hmm. And then when they're comfortable and you're comfortable, you can always move it in. Mm -hmm. But it's very hard to move it out without offense. Somebody's going to be mm -hmm. offended. And so mm -hmm. you just have to make up your mind. You're not going to be the one. Mm -hmm. That's so really just reset from that place. Wow. That's beautiful. Dr. Halisa, our time is already up. I can't believe it. I, I had about, I have a list of questions I was going to ask you. <laughs> I wanted to pick your brain, <laughs> but how was your day? <laughs> I've been sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> You've had a busy day. So ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to, um, uh, I wasn't going to have an after party, but I will do about a five minute after party uh, just so that everyone can say hello. And um, uh, do you have time to be with us, Halisa, for about for about five minutes? Sure. So, OK, um, I will do that. So thank you all very much for for joining us for this Tuesday talk. Uh, be blessed. We will see you um, on our next Tuesday talk. I'm going to be having Bonnie Manning come on and She's going to be sharing with us. I'm very excited about that. I know. What wonderful. So everyone be blessed so much. Stay with us um, for the after party. Those of you that are here live and we will be talking with you soon. Be blessed. Katrina, did you grab the recording? Great. To just make sure that the recording stopped. Okay. All right.